Hey, welcome back, everyone. So today, 23 years ago, the Chinese Communist Party launched what is really probably the biggest genocide in the world right now. A hundred million people roughly persecuted, tortured, killed, and harvested for their organs, sometimes while they're still alive. Uh, this is the persecution of Falun Gong, and really something that the media has not in any way, and I'm not talking about Epic Times, but a lot of the mainstream media has not in any way really given proper weight to. Uh, this is a persecution that's impacted one out of roughly every 13 Chinese people and really has created the whole pay-to-play systems uh, uh, that it has really created a lot of corruption within the Chinese Communist Party. If you want to rise up in the ranks of the Chinese Communist Party, you have to get blood on your hands. And this is how it works. This is important for a lot of reasons. One of the big ones is that companies doing business in China, investment firms doing business in China, BlackRock, for example, Gates, for example, many others, they may be implicated in this in the future. And the reason for this actually ties to back to a tribunal that took place in 2019 in the UK, which actually declared that the Chinese Communist Party is harvesting the organs from living people, oftentimes without painkillers, usually without painkillers, uh, with a murder-for-profit scheme that is constitutes a genocide. They, they place it on par with the Holocaust. It's, that's the way they describe it. And that companies, businesses, investors, and so on, that have continued to do business with China despite that, are doing business with a criminal regime, meaning they may be implicated in the future. I want to show you all the evidence on this, because I know a lot of people still wonder, well, is this really happening? Like, is there really organ harvesting taking place in China? And yes, there is. And I, I think the reason a lot of people don't think that maybe it's happening or they're not sure whether it's happening is mainly because, well, frankly, a lot of the media, whenever they write about it, they say it's suggested or claimed or rumored and so on. When in reality, there's been substantial reporting and it's now definitive. It's, it's happening without a shadow of a doubt and on a very large scale. So, folks, going to be an interesting uh, episode today, one that I think is really important, not just, again, as it relates to just human rights, but as it relates to possible human rights trials that may be soon to come. Uh, really, when the, when the light comes out on this, we're going to see Nuremberg-like trials uh, for members of the Chinese Communist Party and very likely Western businessmen, Western investors who've taken part in this, and there's going to be a lot of them. Let me show you what do we have, folks. I want to start now by going into J July 20th, 1999, which is when the persecution of Falun Gong started, how the live, li live organ harvesting issue was exposed, and also some of the evidence and proof that's come out since then. And uh, we're also going to have a guest on today with Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting. So if you have any questions and so on, uh, we're going to have a guest on who can answer a lot of those. The other big side of this is that this organ harvesting system is corrupting the fields of medicine. Uh, another big issue and something to watch out for as this thing advances. All right, that said, folks, again, uh, those of you on YouTube, remember after about 20, 25 minutes, we will jump exclusively over at Epic TV. So if you don't have an account yet, be sure to grab that. Uh, we're going to be a free trial. It's in the description below this video. And also, it helps us do what we're doing. So I appreciate the support, and also we'll give you some great content with that. Um, also, we do the live Q&A over on Epic TV. So if you want to join the live Q&A, you have questions you want to discuss, uh, there's always some really great discussion. So be sure to come join us over on Epic TV. Even if you just want, to, just want to check it out, grab that free trial. So let's jump into it. I want to show you how this really started. So long story, I'll, I'll go more into the persecution of Falun Gong as we get the guest on later. But briefly, so Falun Gong is a Chinese meditation practice. Imagine imagine if the U.S. government tomorrow said, hey, uh, yoga is now illegal. Basically, Falun Gong was a Qigong practice, which is like you see Chinese people doing slow movements in the parks. The Chinese Communist Party declared it was a threat to the atheistic rule of the Communist Party at a time when it was the most popular Qigong practice in China, uh, roughly 100 million people practicing. And it declared that anybody practicing it would be subject to arrest and possibly murder, uh, which did happen. One out of every 13 Chinese people was made into a criminal overnight. And we found out, Epic Times found out around 2006, about you know, seven years after the persecution had started, 
that very likely they were using prisoners of conscience, religious believers in this case, as living sources for organ transplants. And this was an international crime ring essentially run by the Chinese Communist Party, Chinese hospitals, and particularly the Chinese military. A lot of this was taking place through Chinese military hospitals. You had systems including organ tourism, where even doctors in foreign countries were involved in this, sending patients to China for organ transplants, uh, some, sometimes maybe not knowing full well what was happening, but having at least the, the subtle idea, right? Having, having at least the subtle idea that, of course, the Chinese Communist Party was using executed prisoners. What they did not realize is that a prisoner in China is not necessarily a real criminal. In this case, again, it was religious believers, and this continues today. So, 2006, some stories started coming out. Epic Times broke a lot of them. We had whistleblowers stepping forward. I was actually with Epic Times at that time, and my, my career with Epic Times started in 2006, in fact. There were whistleblowers stepping forward, including, um, including people who had worked in the Chinese military, high-ranking officers, including one woman was the wife of one of the transplant doctors, and the claims they had were shocking. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to get too graphic with you folks, but some of them were extremely disturbing. Um, one of the women who stepped forward, she was the wife of a doctor, she came, she came forward and had a horrifying story to tell, that her husband, who was a transplant doctor, basically was just staying up at night, staring off into space, cold sweats, like something wasn't right with him. Finally, one day, he confided in her, and he said that his job was to harvest the corneas from the eyes of children, living children. Um, and of course, he understood that they were still alive while he was doing this. The woman, when she found out she divorced him, left China, came to the United States, and became a whistleblower. She was among the first. We had others soon after stepping forward, one of them being a high-ranking Chinese military officer, and he had horrifying stories as well. Rumors of trains being uh, transporting people, prisoners, people hung up like cattle, uh, you know, hands handcuffed with metal bars attached to the ceiling, and people you know, strung up like cattle to these metal bars across the ceiling of these train cars, being moved to Chinese military hospitals and being moved through the system. I'm going to show you one of the articles we had back in 2006 as we began researching this, as the rumors were first coming out, and we were just trying to figure out if these things were true or not, because they were horrifying stories, um, evidence from the individuals coming out and blowing the whistle on this aligned with some of the weird testing that some of the human rights you know people who had escaped prison or uh, you know fled the country had told us as well and so the evidence lined up we were just trying to figure out well is this really true let me show you this this is 2006 the epic times it says doctors in china working overtime on organ transplants it says, Falun Gong practitioners in underground concentration camps, including Sujiatun uh, Suji camp, have been secretly relocated and are subject to slaughter at any time. Meanwhile, some hospitals in China have suddenly increased the number of transplant operations, apparently a massacre with the purpose of exterminating all witnesses of such concentration camps is taking place right now in China. This was 2006. That was an urgent announcement issued by clearwisdom.net on April 6, 2006. It was a Falun Dafa website, mainly on human rights issues. It says, reporters from Sound of Hope Radio, and independent media, made phone calls to major hospitals in China with a human organ transplant department in order to assess the current situation. Most of the medical doctors that answered the phone gave the same guarantee. There will be an unusually large number of organ donors before May 1st. That's, this was in 2006. After that date, after May 1st, the chance of a donor will become much smaller. Now, so basically, there were reporters making phone calls into China. They were calling up Chinese hospitals, you know, mainly the ones that do organ transplants. And these reporters, of course, speaking Chinese, we're asking these hospitals, oh, do you have organs? I need to get a liver transplant. I need to get a heart transplant. And the doctors on the other end were saying, of course, in Chinese, yes, we have tons. Come anytime. 
they were asking, well, how long is the wait? They're like, maybe a, a week, maybe a, a couple days. Anybody who knows how organ transplants usually work, anybody who understands this, uh, maybe you've had a family member who's needed one or you just looked into it, you'll know that it's not like you wait a couple days and get an organ transplant. You go on a waiting list and it's sometimes, it's sometimes a very long time. The way that organ transplants typically work in the United States and other parts of the world is it's based on a donor system. And so it's a person gets in a car accident or a person you know, has an unfortunate accident that renders them brain dead. And because they're brain dead, they may have signed up to become organ donors, which you can sign up for when you get your driver's license. And they can voluntarily give their organs if they are in such a state, right? This state where they're brain dead. You can't predict that normally. And even then, even if you're on the list and there's a donor that comes up, it's a very complex process because it has to match your DNA. There has to be a DNA match. And even then, there's other processes as well. It's not easy to get an organ donor for especially things like hearts. In China, they say pretty much like buffet, come, come and get all you need. And this is what happened. So actually, this article we had that I'm showing you actually had the audio recordings included with it. Our reporter at that time in 2006 actually made a lot of phone calls to try to corroborate what other media were finding, other independent media, not mainstream media, were finding at that time. Now, mainstream media, I should note, New York Times and others, they were claiming this whole thing was just rumors and propaganda or whatever else. Like, they were pretty much siding with the Chinese Communist Party. But, of course, independent media, a small handful of them, Epic Times being the main one, uh, were trying to verify whether or not this was true. This article that I'm showing you right now, they did the phone calls, they recorded those phone calls, and they included the phone calls in this article. I won't play them yet. Well, at the end of this episode, let's see if I can play you some, but they're in Chinese, and so it's done, you know, unless you speak Chinese, it's not going to be interesting for you. But it says this further in. According to doctors interviewed, all the donors are in their 20s and 30s. Young people, right? Not, not elderly people having issues. Suddenly, tons of donors, any donor you could need, all in their, mostly in their 20s and 30s. They're very healthy, which is odd as well, because why would healthy people be dead, essentially? They, they could take their organs. And the doctors guarantee that livers and kidneys are from living human beings. So, not dead. They can even provide a whole liver, they said, which is also unusual. Now, so for some blood type, they can find matching donors right away, instantly. Again, something you just don't have happen. Now, it says further in, since Su Jiatun concentration camp was exposed to the world, the World Organization to Investigate the Persecution of Falun Gong immediately started an investigation all over China. Their investigation revealed that there were at least eight provinces in, and cities in China that harvest internal organs from living Falun Gong practitioners, including Hunan Province, Shandong Province, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Beijing, Tianjin, Liaoning Province, and Hubei Province. Employees and surgeons in hospitals of these areas guaranteed the investigators they could supply Falun Gong practitioners internal organs. If you read the actual transcripts, the doctors were very open about it at that time. After these initial investigations came out, they became less forthcoming. They became a little more cautious about what they said over the phone. But they confirmed, if you listen to the audio recordings, and if they have transcripts of them, of course, that these are from Falun Gong practitioners, they're from healthy people, they're from young people, and the organs are being taken from people who are still alive. Now, this sparked a lot of international concern. A lot of media, of course, wrote it off. You know, the mainstream media, I should say. A lot of the mainstream media wrote this off and said, oh, it's unfounded rumors, it's fake news, or whatever, whatever. you know, the stuff they always do. But a handful of people internationally decided to look into it. Two of those individuals uh, were the former, a former Canadian member of Parliament, that was David Kilgore, and an international human rights lawyer, David Mattis. They launched an, inter an independent investigation from from Canada. You know, former Canadian member of former member of the Canadian government, of course, you know, Parliament, and a human rights lawyer launched an independent investigation, and they published their findings in a book that's called "Bloody Harvest: The Killing of Falun Gong for Their Organs." 
Now, they understood that when you're, for example, these guys had previously investigated like Holocaust issues, David Mattis in particular, and he understood that when you're dealing with a, dealing with a genocide, when you're dealing with a state-run system to eradicate groups of a society, that oftentimes they take steps to cover it up. And so they understood that there has to be circumstantial evidence. You gain all you gain all the evidence from all the periphery and then work your way in and see how far you can get. This was their conclusion on that. This is Fallen Info, one of the Fallen Dafa human rights websites that had an excerpt of it. Let me show you. They said this. When we began our work, we had no this is David Mattis and David Kilgore in their book, again, Bloody Harvest. They wrote this. When we began our work, we had no views whether the allegations were true or untrue. The allegations were so shocking that they are almost impossible to believe. Our preference would have been to find that the allegations to be untrue. The allegations, if true, represented a disgusting form of evil, which, despite all the depra depravities humanity has seen, was new to this planet. The very horror made us reel back in disbelief. But disbelief did not mean that the allegations were untrue. Further in, they state, Our conclusion is that there has been and continues today to be large-scale organ seizure from unwilling Falun Gong practitioners. We have concluded that the government of China and its agencies in numerous parts of the country, in particular hospitals but also detention centers and quote-unquote people's courts, since 1999, when the persecution began, Today is the anniversary again, July 20th. Since 1999, have put to death a large but unknown number of Falun Gong prisoners of conscience. Their vital organs, including kidneys, livers, corneas, and hearts, were seized involuntarily for the sale at high prices, sometimes to foreigners who normally face long waits for voluntary donations of such organs in their home countries. In 2008, shortly after they wrote that, shortly after they published their findings, uh, David Mattis actually wrote an open letter. This was in the special consultative status with the United Nations. And so they were trying to raise concerns and, you know, raise investigations with this through the United Nations and trying to get things moving on. Let's keep in mind this is 2008, so a good while back now when they were trying to do this. And this was before, the, before, before I'd say the CCP had really gained a lot of control that it now has over the United Nations. You know, the CCP now essentially controls, to a large extent, the Human Rights Council. But back then, that wasn't the case. And David Mattis wrote this open letter back then. 2008, he said this, talking about, again, their investigations that they had done in 2006. He said, the report is now over two years old. The fact that over those two years, the report has survived the scrutiny of peer review has not been contradicted in any way whatsoever serves to validate the report. In other words, the, the findings they published in Bloody Harvest were never, were never debunked. They were, they were peer-reviewed, they were never debunked, they stood solid, and they were saying based on that alone, that should have raised some serious alarms at the United Nations. There should have been real, like, you know, Holocaust-level, you know, tribunals looking into this, essentially, at that time. Uh, there should have been, like, Nuremberg trials, putting these people on trial, and this is the issue he was raising at that time. He said the sheer silliness, right, the sheer silliness and, and vacuity uh, of the Chinese government response means that the government of China, in substance, has nothing to say in answer to our report. And he says the peer review to which I am referring is that of the University of Minnesota Associate, Director of the Program in Human Rights and Medicine, Kirk Allison of British Transport... Uh, tran of transplant surgeon Tom Treasure and of Yale University thesis student Hao Wong. They have all independently from us and each other confirmed the conclusions of the report and supported its accuracy. Meaning that even back then, even back in 2008, this was deemed as credible, this was deemed as serious, and also deemed as something that should have been in criminally investigated. At that time, he still had the issue that the media right, the New York Times and others were still denying it, and even now you'll see a lot of them say it's unfounded rumors and so on. The irony is that the statement these were unfounded rumors were themselves unfounded. 
These were media lying and covering up one of the biggest crimes against humanity I think the world has ever seen. Now, I want to go over this a bit more because, you know, I'm talking about what happened really a while back, 2008. Unfortunately, after David Kilgore and David Mattis released their reports, they became really two of the only major voices talking about this. One of the other major voices was an independent investigative journalist named Ethan Gutman, who also did his own uh, book on this called Slaughter, um, talking again about organ harvesting. And these three individuals toured around the world for years, they still do, trying to raise awareness over this human rights abuse. These were not Falun Gong petitioners. These are, I don't know what their religions are. I think, I think one might be Jewish, and I think two might be Christian, but I'm not quite sure. But they were raising this issue because this, as they made clear, is really one of the most serious human rights abuses the world has ever seen. Finally, in 2019, a major breakthrough took place. There was additional research over the years. Epic Times, we were one of the few media that continued reporting on this. Uh, and one of the few media that really, I think, did our investigations on this. And so we did have pretty constant coverage on this over the course of, you know, all these years. In 2019, though, a tribunal in the United Kingdom actually, for several years, had been investigating this. They held a trial, like it was actually a pretty, pretty substantive investigation held a trial, and they determined that the Chinese Communist Party is, in fact, harvesting organs from Falun Gong practitioners. That report in 2019, not that long ago, was ground-shaking. That report actually got the attention of the mainstream media and international leadership, and that report began changing things. Unfortunately, I'd say that a lot of the mainstream media, for some reason, when they write about organ harvesting, they still say claimed or rumored or whatever, when in reality it was investigated fully and determined without a doubt to be happening. They had over 50 witnesses who testified. It was chaired by Sir Geoffrey Nice, uh, QC. Let me show you The Guardian. They actually had an article on it at that time. The Guardian said this, China is harvesting organs from detainees, tribunal concludes. And it says an independent tribunal sitting in London has concluded that the killing of detainees in China for organ transplants is continuing, and victims include imprisoned followers of, follow, of the Falun Gong movement. What they really determined was that the overwhelming, overwhelming majority were Falun Gong practitioners, but again, it continues stating the, the China Tribunal, chaired by Sir Geoffrey Nice, uh, QC, who was a prosecutor at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, for former Yugoslavia, said in a unanimous determination at the end of its hearings, it was certain, quote, certain that Falun Gong as a source, probably the principal source, of organs uh, for forced organ harvesting. And it said the conclusion shows that the, that the very many people have died indescribably hideous deaths for no reason, that, may, that more may suffer in similar ways, and that all of us live on a planet where extreme wickedness may be found in the, power, in the power of those for the time being running a country with one of the oldest civilizations known to modern man. He continues, There is no evidence of the practice having been stopped, and the tribunal is satisfied that it is continuing says this, continuing that the tribunal has been taking evidence from medical experts, human rights investigators, and others, and among those killed, it has been alleged, are the members of religious minorities such as Falun Gong. In reality, the tribunal determined that Falun Gong was the principal source of the or these organs, and they note that persecution of the group began in 1999 after it attracted tens of millions of followers and, became, and came to be seen as a threat to the Communist Party, ironically just because the CCP didn't like what it stood for, which was truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. It says also there is less evidence about the treatments of Tibetans, Uyghur Muslims, and some Christian sects. Of course, when people talk about organ harvesting, they often talk about Uyghur Muslims now. Uh, evidence does show that it appears they are targeting them. The tribunal could not determine as substantially that it was happening to other groups. The tribunal found that the main primary source is Falun Gong practitioners. The concerns raised later are that pretty much a lot of these other religious groups are on the side and pretty much they're next in line after the CCP eradicates 
these, you know, 100 million people who practice Falun Gong in China. In 2020, there was another pretty substantial investigation. This was uh, from the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Actually, one of my former colleagues did this one, Matthew Robertson. Um, actually, Math Matthew and I, so he doesn't work with Epic Times anymore. He's an independent researcher now. He's worked with the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. He does peer-reviewed studies, and he's one of the main biggest investigators on this. Uh, he had actually won awards for his coverage of the organ harvesting from the, from the Society of Professional Journalists. And so he was also on the forefront of a lot of these investigations. Really incredible guy. Um, he and I worked together a lot. I was more investigating Chinese subversion, spy rings, Chinese mafia, and how the communist government worked that whole system. That was my beat, really. Matthew was on, Matthew Robertson, he was on the beat looking into the organ harvesting. And so he and I worked together a lot, and really great guy. He made a huge breakthrough in 2020 with a peer-reviewed study, a peer-reviewed report that really, in the, at the academic level, changed the whole narrative on the organ harvesting. So on the criminal level, political level, a lot had been done. 2020 was the academic level. And he wrote this report. It says, Organ Procurement and Extrajudicial Execution in China, a Review of the Evidence. It says, Starting in 2000, the PRC, People's Republic of China, rapidly constructed a world-class organ transplantation system that began performing tens of thousands of transplants annually. It continues stating the claim that the majority of organs could have come from death row prisoners is contradicted by the well-established decline in death row executions in 2000 onwards, because the CCP used to claim these were death row prisoners they were taking the organs from. It continues stating evidence pointing to this source includes the coincidence of the anti-Falun Gong campaign in July 20th, 1999, with the rapid growth of China's transplant industry six months later, so... July 20th, 1999, the Chinese Communist Party began its persecution of Falun Gong. Six months later, the Chinese Communist Party's transplant interest industry, the organ transplants, just skyrocketed. There was no explanation for it, and the data they provided didn't show any reason why that happened. He continues stating, widely reported blood tests and physical examinations consistent with those required of organ procurement, telephone admissions by Chinese doctors, threats of organ harvesting by prison and labor camp guards, and participants, uh, participation in the anti-Falun Gong campaign by Chinese transplant surgeons. It says, since 2015, due to international pressure, China's organ transplantation system has claimed to source organs from voluntary donors only. Forensic analysis of the relevant data shows that it has been falsified. In other words, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, has been lying to the world while continuing these atrocities. This appears to be a deliberate attempt to deceive the international medical community as to the current source of organs in China. Given the transplants continue, both at scale and on demand, it appears that a secondary concealed organ source is now also being exploited. He raised the point in 2020, one year after the tribunal, that it appeared that uh, the CCP had begun using uh, more Uyghur Muslims in addition to Falun Gong practitioners. Shocking stuff, folks. Um, I'm going to get on an expert to talk with us more about this. Before we jump over to Epic TV, though, I know we're going a bit long on YouTube, but I hope you enjoy it because I, I think this is an important enough topic. I really more than anything, just want to get this story out there, because I, a lot of you I know had asked about this previously. You were wondering if this was really true. I know some of the questions you had asked, uh, is this really happening? And I wanted to show you the evidence, because, yeah, the evidence is undeniable at this point. There, there's undeniable evidence. The Chinese Communist Party is using prisoners of conscience for living organ transplants on a massive scale. I'm, I'm not showing you the worst of it, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I mentioned briefly that they do the China, the doctors in China, they do this while the individuals are still alive, because it reduces chance of organ failure. They also do it without painkillers, and they they found a way to do that by tying the prisoners up very tightly, using a type of string that will cut into the prisoners if they you know shake and so on. Um, they they've gotten this down to a science of how to kill people for their organs, cutting their organs out of their bodies while they're still living and breathing, and while they still feel this pain. The real important part with this is a couple, a couple of pretty major things for those of us in the United States. 
first of all, any individual who has been doing business with the Chinese Communist Party, knowing this is taking place since 2019 at the very least, is complicit in these crimes. That means any medical official working with the Chinese Communist Party, any medical establishment like the World Health Organization working with the Chinese Communist Party, any scientific research engaged with Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party, especially on medicine, I won't name any names on that, but I think you know who could, that could be. Investment firms like BlackRock, Fauci better be careful on this as well. These individuals could be implicated in these crimes in the future, in the very near future, I would say. And I want to, sh and in addition to that too, the CCP is trying to expand this. They, they are corrupting the global medical system through this. And you can look at the things they've done cooperating with medical institutions right here in the United States, NIH, NIAD, all these different organizations working with the Chinese Communist Party while the CCP is carrying out a genocide through these medical systems. And I want to show you the evidence of this because I'm not just, I'm not just spewing a hot air. I'm not just talking about rumor. I'm going to show you the final judgment from that China tribunal making this statement that the crimes, in their own words, are on par with the Holocaust of Nazi Germany, and that anybody who is engaged with the Chinese Communist Party is engaging with the criminal regime and could be held liable for that. I'm going to show you this. We'll jump over to do our interview after this in a bit. But I want to make sure to, I want, I want to show you all the evidence, folks. All of their are Doctors killed those innocent people simply because they pursued truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance in the case of Falun Gong practitioners and lived lives of healthy exercise and meditation that was seen as dangerous to the interests and objectives of the totalitarian state of the People's Republic of China. This is a very uncomfortable truth, inconvenient truth. China needs to stop what they're doing. Where else in the world can you go and get an organ within two weeks? I hope today no one can turn around to pretend that they don't know this is happening. It's important that we never lose sight of the human side of this story. I hope this judgment will awaken some uh, consciousness from uh, Chinese surgeons. There's lots of important decisions that we need to make as a, as a transplant community as to how we take this judgment forward. The tribunal concluded with this very powerful statement about uh, any government, any entity, any individual dealing with the Chinese Communist Party state is in effect dealing with a, a criminal state. They actually single out China as a criminal state. And I think nothing will be the same after this. Any who interact in any substantial way with the PRC, including doctors and medical institutions, industry and businesses, most specifically airlines, travel companies, financial services businesses, law firms, pharmaceutical insurance companies, together with individual tourists, educational establishments, and art establishments, should now recognize that they are, to the extent revealed in this judgment, interacting with a criminal state. Yeah, there you go, folks. All these institutions that have been working with the Chinese Communist Party, especially on the medical front, are now working with a criminal state. Determined officially in 2019 by that China tribunal, the same folks who looked into Yugoslavia. And again, really, once this reaches the light of day, once, I think, I'm showing, I think we went over some evidence yesterday that uh, really the CCP is on its way down. Once that happens, you can expect Nuremberg-like trials of every individual who's been involved with this. The Chinese Communist Party under Jiang Zemin, the former leader of the Chinese Communist Party, created a pay-to-play system where if you wanted to rise up in power, if you wanted to do business in China, if you wanted to get anywhere, you had to participate in some way within the system. The system he created inside China was the persecution of Falun Gong. You had to get blood on your hands. So folks, this will be the future. You can expect this to come. The, the truth is already coming out. I mean, I, you know, me and my colleagues have been some of the people at the forefront reporting on this over the years. And it's not, it's, it's one of those stories that you kind of wish you got wrong 
You know what I mean? But unfortunately, this is, this is happening. All right, folks, thank you for being here. Um, let's bring on our guest. This is Dr. G. Weldon Gilcrease. He's the Deputy Director of Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting. And if you have questions as well, leave them in the chat. Um, really, I think it's an important discussion, really important topic. Hey, Doctor, thanks for being here with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's really a pleasure and an honor to, to be on your show, Josh. Yeah, so first off, just briefly tell us about your organization, Doctors Against Forced Organ mm -hmm. Harvesting. Like, what are you? Why did you start? What's the, what's the focus? Yeah, so back in 2006, a report came out um, called the Madison Kilgore Report, which essentially followed 33 different evidentiary trails on allegations that the Chinese Communist Party was orchestrating the systematic killing of prisoners of conscience. So these are, you know, innocent people, predominantly Falun Gong practitioners. And essentially, these people were being typed as they were put into labor camps, prisons and detention centers and undergoing, they were undergoing torture. And this, this, there was actually a, a, a woman who went by the pseudonym Annie, who in the spring of, of 2006 came out and said that her husband, who was a neurosurgeon, had cut the corneas out of two to 3,000 uh, live Falun Gong victims. And <clears throat> so the, as a follow-up, essentially through a series of different events, uh, David Matus and David Kilgore, who were, are Canadians, uh, went about and, and, and uh, tried to follow a lot of the, the, the evidence. And basically what they found was uh, China, which was a country that had no organ donation or distribution system, a country that that sort of culturally uh, believes in this Confucian idea that you 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 bring your body intact into the next life and and so the, the body is to stay undisturbed and so there, there it, culturally wasn't wasn't a, a country where where you know like the United States where where donating organs was was a part of it so a country without organ donation or distribution system in the early 2000s coinciding with the persecution the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners they were suddenly doing, they went from doing, as an example that I often give, 15 to 20 liver transplants per year from 1977 to 1999. In the early 2000s, they were doing two to 3,000 transplants per year without an explanation of where they were coming from. And uh, David Matus and David Kilgore in their report essentially showed that uh, they were killing uh, innocent prisoners of conscience that had been typed and then killing them on demand for organ transplant. And this was all orchestrated by the Chinese Communist Party, but was being carried out in uh, predominantly military hospitals, but also uh, civilian hospitals. And so in 2007, Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting was created really to try to bring attention to this, because as you can imagine, Josh, you know, you're up against this, this, I mean, you're up against one of the most powerful propaganda machines in the world and one of the most powerful uh, countries in the world in the, in, in the Chinese Communist Party. And you're, uh, you know, a, a scrappy group of doctors trying to say w we we should do something. So the organization has been around uh, uh, several years ago. We were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and th the idea is to raise awareness, but ultimately to to have action to stop these horrific crimes. Hmm. Now, I want, and now today is July twentieth, and this is the twenty third anniversary of the start of the persecution. Can you explain to us like what happened on July twentieth? Why is this day significant in terms of like human rights? Yeah, that's it, a great question, Josh. And, and I think it really does align with the, the, the story of, of forced organ harvesting. So, you know, I, I kind of give you a background of how China had no organ distribution or donation system. But we know that in 1984, uh, the Chinese Communist Party had passed a regulation essentially making it sort of quasi legal to take an executed criminal and uh, use an executed criminal's organs for transplant. Now, the, the number of executions done is a state secret, so we don't really know uh, how many executions were, were, were being done, but as we saw in the early 2000s, this number was, was dropping. But what happened, it, so in the 1990s, you'll, you, you hear stories about executed criminals' or, organs being taken after they're shot in the chest or in, in, in the head, uh, but this is, uh, you, you hear something very different. So on July 20th of, of 1999, Jiang Zemin, the head of the Chinese Communist Party, um, essentially sets in motion a, a, an illegal ban so the, uh, against Falun Gong practitioners. And if you look at it in 1999, there's 70 to 100 million people practicing Falun Gong 
and they're throughout China. They're not geographically located in one specific area of China. They're, 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 they're spread throughout China. And so by doing that, when you set in motion, you know, you, you turn Falun Gong practitioners, uh, and this is a, you know, this is a spiritual practice that actually resonates with ancient uh, Chinese belief, ancient Chinese medicine, and, and a lot of the traditional beliefs. So it was really bringing a lot of the Chinese people back, not through, you know, fear and intimidation and coercion, but, but through changing people's hearts. And so when, when the Chinese Communist Party uh, and Jiang Zemin specifically set in motion uh, this, this persecution of Falun Gong practitioners, even if you take 1% of that 70 million to 100 million practitioners at any given time, you have hundreds of thousands of innocent, relatively healthy, a lot of younger uh, prisoners of conscience. And what you start hearing in the early 2000s are stories of how, as they're being dragged into labor camps and tortured, they're, they're, they're being medically tested before they, they go there. And essentially those medical tests were not to, to check in on their health. I mean, they're, they're undergoing horrific torture, which has been well documented uh, by the UN Special Rapporteur on, on Torture and, and, and a number of different uh, 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 bodies that, that have, have looked at this. So um, July 20th is so important because July 20th in 1999 also coincides in the next two years, you see this explosion, an exponential explosion of transplant activity in China, and you can't do it without human bodies. So that that process beginning in, in in July and you know tomorrow marks the 23rd anniversary of it. That process of dehumanization and demonization of <clears throat> these individuals has to coincide with uh, you know this this explosion in transplants. Just because you really have no other explanation for where you know as I mentioned earlier those those thousands of liver transplants are are, are coming from. Hmm. Now, I think a lot of people are wondering too, you know, what is Falun Gong? Because, you know, if you go on like Wikipedia, they, they just say terrible things about it. it. It's hard to differentiate what is propaganda from China and what is the real story. So, I mean, what is Falun Gong and how does that relate to what we see in like a lot of news articles and so on? Yeah. So, so Falun Gong is a, is a, it's a self-cultivation practice of mind and body. I mean, really it's a, again, it, it really has a lot of ties to, to traditional Chinese thought and traditional Chinese belief like Taoism and Confucianism and, Bud and specifically Buddhism. And it, it, the, I think one of the difficult things is, you know, in the, it, it was first made public in, in 1992 and it was free. It was open to all. It had no membership, which I actually think left the, 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 the group very vulnerable. But by 1999, when there were 70 million to 100 million by Chinese Communist Party numbers, uh, people practicing, again, scattered geographically throughout China, this became a real threat in terms of, of numbers uh, because it was actually more than the roughly 65 million active Chinese Communist Party members. So it had outgrown them, but it's also, you know, it's, it's also really tied to, to traditional, uh, I think, uh, belief in, in China, uh, respect for the divine, respect for one another. This is antithetical to, to uh, Chinese Communist Party ethics. I mean, if you look at their rule, it's rule with an iron fist. If you look at their campaigns of smashing the four olds or old culture, old customs, old history, old ideas, this was to try to uproot and ferret out and essentially destroy all the traditional beliefs and, and traditions of, of uh, you know, of a country that had thousands of years of, of history. So the, the way that I look at Falun Gong is it's a self-cultivation practice rooted in the Buddhist school that's centered around basic tenets of truth and compassion and tolerance. And the reason that you see this propaganda sort of parroted on Wikipedia is because I think in the West, we really have no idea what, what the truth is because we've heard such incessant propaganda coming from, and if you really think about it, especially in the modern era with technology, this is the most powerful propaganda tool we have ever seen. I mean, it, it's nothing like what we saw with in, in the 20th century or in the early 1900s, just because you can affect so many more people, you can do it so much more efficiently and effectively. So. It, it is a, a traditional practice. It, it, it really, I think the reason you saw it really go from a standstill in, in, in its first teaching in 1992 to 70 to 100 million people is because it really, it, in my view, it resonated with you know, the, 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 the deep kind of rooted 
ethics and morals and values of, of traditional uh, uh, China with truth and compassion and tolerance, which I think Josh also brings up an important idea that, you know, when, with Doctors Against Forced Story and Harvesting, it is not an anti-China organization. It's an anti-Chinese Communist Party organization, which really, you know, sort of a misnomer, right? It, it, the, the Chinese Communist Party isn't really Chinese. It's something that was adopted from the West or, or, or from Eastern Europe or Central Europe. And, and it, it's not really it's not really a party. It's a it's a, it's a single system that has had totalitarian totalitarian rule over the country since it, it initially took power in 1949. Um, and uh, it, it's not even really communist. I mean, it's it, it, it's it's some sort of mutation of, of communism. Hmm. You know, just a few questions from our from our audience. I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, kind of what this means for the United States. Um, one of our one of our audience members, Lisa Keys eight two two, she's asking, do do organs from China make their way to the U.S. for transplants here? I know of an infant who received a transplant in Tennessee rather quickly and wondered where the transplant heart came from. Are aborted baby hearts being sold as transplants? They're asking basically, organs from the Chinese Communist Party, you know, killing Falun Gong practitioners, are are those being sent here? How or you know, organ organ, uh, what you call tourism, like. How does the kind of relation, how, how does this relate to the United States, in other words? Is there yeah, any Josh, overlap? Yeah, it's funny because I wish I could give you a simple answer and I wish I could give you the data on it. I think, I think this is one of the real challenges of our organization and really a challenge of me as a, you know, as an academic physician. It, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, first of all, it's hard to get your hands on, on those numbers. I, I know at my uh, institution where, uh, you know, where uh, I'm an associate professor of medicine, when I tr have tried to figure out, well, how many patients that we have here that we see in a post-transplant setting have gone to China and received an organ, we, we, we have nothing in our uh, electronic health record that is even a field that would say where the, the organ came from. It's, it's simply not asked. Now, most organs are, are coming from within our own state, in the state of Utah. But if somebody were to travel to China and receive an unethically sourced organ, they're likely there's likely a Falun Gong practitioner is the most likely, but also Uyghurs or house Christians or political dissidents. It's likely that that, that person has been killed on demand uh, for that organ. So to answer, I think it's an excellent question. And I think the bigger question is how is the United States tied to the, the Chinese Medical Association or Chinese medicine? And one is how, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do uh, and, and one of the things that, that, that we're, we're trying to push through is an actual, actually a House bill, uh, which is 6319, uh, called the Falun Gong Protection Act. Um, and it's specifically about forced story and harvesting. But I think this is this, one of the specific questions is, how do we know how many Americans have gone? And you can imagine if you're dying of liver failure and you think you only have weeks to live, you know, the, the desperation that, that, that those, those people must be suffering. But to go to, to China and, and have somebody else essentially slaughtered on demand <clears throat> for that organ it simply shouldn't be done and should never be done and is really unconscionable. So I, I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you that there's no way that I can even find out from my own institution. I, I work uh, uh, quite a bit in transplant in our own institution, so I know uh, a lot of the you know a lot of our transplant surgeons. Um, and it, there, there's no way to, to, to get at that because there's nothing that, that requires uh, uh, that information if we're doing the aftercare for, for a transplant. The other piece that I want to talk about is the educational piece. I mean, if you have a country that has no organ donation system or organ distribution system like China, and all of a sudden they're doing thousands of transplants, they have had to learn how to do their transplants somewhere. And if you actually look at the websites from hospitals in China, that we're guaranteeing liver transplants in on with an average waiting time of two weeks, right? That's almost impossible unless you have people that you're going to kill on demand. Those same websites, which you can still access on the Wayback Machine, if you have the right URL and you go back to these Chinese hospitals that were doing transplants, you would see average wait times that were, I mean, just impossible without having a a, a sea of dehuman, dehumanized humanity that that's waiting to be killed for organs on demand. Um, but they, they, ha they had to learn how to do the transplant somewhere. So a lot of them would, would talk about the surgeons and say, 
how they had trained in the United States at these various centers that, that were training them. So I think the training piece is also exceptionally uh, and highly problematic as far as complicity. And I think between training uh, uh, and, and having such a close tie with uh, you know, in collaboration with the, 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 the Chinese medical systems and Chinese hospitals, I, I think that's highly problematic. And it's, you know, it's nothing again, this is not this is not something that's against inherently Chinese physicians or Chinese surgeons or Chinese people. It's actually trying to protect uh, you know their their medical system and their people from these horrific crimes against humanity. Yeah, you, you know, actually, I've researched a lot on kind of the the human body market in general. And one thing that shocked me is that there's in the United States, there's almost no regulations on the human on a human bodies after people are dead. And this has led to some really weird things. For example, like human body parts being shipped to China and human body trafficking and so on. One of the things I think people talk about the most in terms of something that's very in front of our eyes are these human body exhibits where they, they've taken dead, dead bodies and turned them into what are supposed to be works of art. And there's been, of course, a lot of stories suggesting these are executed Chinese prisoners, at least some of them. Uh, one of our guests, Martha N., is asking the plastinization of human bodies used in the science exhibits, you know, quote-unquote, called bodies in the U.S. or whatever else they call them, were said to have come from prisoners of CCP. Has any investigation regarding this you know, come forward? What, what do we know about that? It's a great question, Joss. I, I, so a couple of things that I'll point out. One is if you read uh, uh, Ethan Gutman's book, The Slaughter, and Ethan Gutman, David Matus, David Kilgore wrote a 680 page report that was published in 2016 with over 2,200 pieces of Chinese data, basically detailing how forced organ harvesting was happening. Falun Gong were the number one victims and, uh, and it wasn't stopping. And, but if you read Ethan Gutman's book, there is a, 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 a a, a section on the bodies exhibit. And there's, in my mind, there's no doubt these are young, healthy individuals uh, that look like they, they, they look Asian. And so, um, yes, I, I think it's, it's sort of this grotesque way of almost, you know, almost parading a, a around your, your, your kill. And, you know, you, you, you'll, you actually see, and I go back to your question of what is Falun Gong, that I, I remember there was a bodies exhibit where one of the uh, bodies looked like it was doing one of the uh, uh, Qigong exercises. You know, there are five central meditation exercises in Falun Gong, and there was one that looked like it was doing it. almost a way of, of you know, to me it was almost like this grotesque way of the Chinese Communist Party, sort of pushing uh, pushing this uh, uh, out in, in in front of everyone for everyone to see, and and, and almost taunting, you know, the the, the people that that it slaughtered. The other story I'll give you is I, I have a um, I, I'm the program director for one of the fellowships and one of our fellows who just graduated uh, when he was in Idaho, he worked as a docent for one of these bodies exhibits before he went to medical school. And this is about this is probably about 12, 15 years ago. And it's it was always it, I remember the first time I heard this kind of the hairs on my neck stood up. But one of the stories that he told was as a docent, they had training on 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 qu frequently asked questions and one of the one of the things that they were told is if you're asked if these bodies came from china the answer is simply no and i think this is the way that the chinese communist party often handles this if your audience is familiar with the china tribunal this these were seven yeah. independent members that looked at the data around uh, forced story and harvesting and had a 560 page report that they put out that you can read online if you just go and you search uh, china tribunal you'll find the report the short report is three and a half pages. I would urge every audience member to go out and read uh, those three and a half pages because I think it, it it summarizes very well what these seven members found, and that's unanimously beyond reasonable doubt. Forced organ harvesting has happened. Now, Ethan Gutman does uh, comment on how some of these bodies, organs are missing. Of course, the skin is missing, which can be an organ in and of itself. That that that's. Uh, um, uh, that, that's harvested and transplanted. Um, but yeah, I, I it, my, personally, I have no doubt, but the, as far as testing and trying to figure out, you know, how, how this has happened, that, that just hasn't been, uh, I, as far as I know, it hasn't been uh, that well done. But Josh, you point out a good, a very outstanding point is, is, you know, if we had tighter regulations on what happens after death with bodies, would we have a better idea of 
you know, where these bo where the bodies are coming from. And I think there's at least my understanding is there's some legal debate with these plastinated bodies, whether they're actually the body or just um, some plastinated form of it. Yeah, actually, on, on, on that note, too, you briefly you briefly mentioned the skin as being an organ. And of course, the bodies exhibit they're oftentimes people without skin. There are terrifying stories of, you know, quote unquote, organ transplants in China, mainly around, you know, executed prisoners, even, even if we go by the death row inmate one. There was eyewitness accounts, maybe you're familiar with this, of them shooting one of these prisoners, skinning the person, and they found out the person was still alive uh, while they were skinning the person alive. I mean, they, they, they take the skin in addition to the organs, which is, I mean, just another level of, you can imagine what these people go through. I mean, and on that note, I want, I want to ask you kind of on that point, we, you know, we know that they do this oftentimes without anesthesia, that they, this is done without painkillers. Like, what do we know about the process? What do these people suffer when this happens? Yeah, it's a, that's an outstanding question, Josh. If, if in, uh, on, I think it was April 4th of this year, so about three months ago, three and a half months ago, there was a publication in the American Journal of Transplantation by actually someone who used to work for Epoch Times, uh, Matthew Robertson, who's a PhD student and uh, very technologically savvy. Uh, he and uh, Jacob Levy, who's a cardiothoracic and heart transplant surgeon from Israel, who's been very uh, heavily, uh, 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 he, he, he's been heavily involved with Doctors Against Forced Stone Harvesting and helping us combat these, these horrific uh, crimes against humanity. Um, and they they had a publication that was that was very eerie. They looked at uh, transplants in China. So what they did is they they combed the medical literature that was in the Chinese language alone. And Matthew Robertson speaks fluent Chinese, and he was able to do this um, search where they looked at all the publications and they 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 specifically specifically whittled it down to heart and lung transplant publications. And at the end of the day, they found 71 publications from uh, during this time, 1980 to 2015. They picked 2015 because it was in 2015 that the Chinese Communist Party or the Chinese medical system said they now had a do donation system. So these are the years that they did not have an organ donation system. And in 71 of these publications, there's there's mention of the process of how the donor uh, uh, died and and it was clear in all of these publications and you can read that publication again the american journal of transplantation is actually a, you know w one of the highest impact factor uh, uh publications in transplant so it's a very you know well respected publication but you can read that publication and it actually quotes some of some of the um uh um publications i think there were four or five quotes one of them essentially it was clear that they had they, 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 the 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 publication talks about how they cut the chest open, looked at the heart. The heart was, they, I think they said purple and beating weakly. And then they intubated the patient, meaning they put a breathing tube down into the trachea to put them on ventilation. Well, if you're spontaneously breathing, you're not brain dead. And so to me, this publication really is a smoking gun, or if not the smoking gun that, that shows that these people, and to answer your question, Josh, most of these were anesthetized. Um, and I don't know if they were just paralyzed and not anesthetized. In, in medicine, we talk about, yeah, here's the publication. In, 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 tran in transplant and in medicine, you know, there, there's, there's you can paralyze a patient, but they can still feel. And then you can anesthetize them where, where they don't feel or they're not conscious. But clearly, these, these patients, as execution by organ procurement, breaching the dead donor rule in China, these 71 pu publications show that these people were not brain dead. I see. You know, um, one question I think a lot of my viewers have, just I'm kind of reading the comments. Um, a lot of people want to know whether I think the medical establishment maybe in the United States or even the World Health Organization, if they could be implicated in any way with these crimes, if, if there's kind of any overlap, I guess. I mean, I'm not asking you to make criminal accusations, but but generally speaking, because that was one of the big uh, conclusions with the China tribunals, that any institution now doing business with the Chinese Communist Party should understand they're doing business with a criminal regime. To what extent could, you know, hypothetically, I guess for now, because I don't want to make you criminally accuse people, but 
hypothetically, to what extent could medical establishments around the world be implicated in this? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And, you know, as I, 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 you know, I'll try to answer you the best I can as a, as a physician. I, I mean, I think, you know, if, if you read the Hippocratic Oath, which unfortunately I would say, you know, the, the, the predominance of, of even medical doctors here, certainly in China, they don't take the oath. But, but uh, our obligation isn't just to, you know, it's predominantly to the patient that's sitting in front of us, but it's to the population at large. And, and I think when, when you see a medical field that's conscripted by a totalitarian regime, you know, just as you mentioned, it wasn't just businesses that the tribunal was calling out. It was medical institutions, doctors, airlines. I mean, anyone that, that's, that's, that's tied in any way to the Chinese Communist Party. And what they said was just exactly what you said, Josh, that they should now realize that they're, they're dealing with a, a criminal state or a criminal regime. Um, personally, yeah, I, I, I think I have, and, and this isn't even sp speaking on behalf of Doctors Against Forced Urban Harvesting, but on, from a personal perspective, I do feel we need a, a decoupling. I do feel that there is, uh, there is complicity in a horrific way, and in, in the two things I mentioned before, in either training people in transplant that have gone back to essentially be the hands of, you know, a, a, of a genocidal machine, or at least in the words of the, the tribunal, crimes against humanity and, and the machine that, that that's carrying that out. So I, I do think it's problematic that we've trained them. I think it's problematic that we have continued uh, t take a stance of collaboration, which from an economic perspective and a political perspective we've seen is highly problematic. Josh, you, I mean, you pointed this out better than I ever could uh, on, on your show multiple times, but th this, th these ties are extremely problematic. And I do, I, I don't know from a legal standpoint if it would meet uh, uh, sort of the definition of, of criminal um, but, you know, th this this happened during the Holocaust, right, where people were just just kind of turn a blind eye and said, I was just doing my job and trying to stay out of trouble. And in some ways in the medical field, we, we have the same serious problem with complicity. And just to mention this, I've tried even at my own institution to have some kind of policy or, or try to have something that happens within a, a large academic institution. And typically what happens is on a, on an individual level, you get a lot of support. But when it rises to the level of, of an institution or a hospital, it, 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 it then becomes let, let's not, you know, let, let's not entwine ourselves in something that's political is, is often how it's portrayed. But that political label, to me, it, it suits the, the Chinese Communist Party well, but does not suit, uh, I guess, human rights defenders very well. I see. You know, uh, some more questions from our audience. Um, Anne F. is asking, so do foreigners go to China to receive the transplant? It has to be done within a few hours, which raises some questions around the, the timing again of how quick they get these organs, right? Yeah. And, and you know, one of the one of the most horrific stories you'll, you'll hear, and I think this is why Dr. Jay Levy, who was one of the authors on, uh, he was the second author on on the paper you just showed. So he's a cardiothoracic transplant surgeon. And in 2005, he's rounding on a patient who's dying of heart failure. And in Israel, they don't have, they don't, they don't have a robust transplant system, even like we have here. So their donation system, they, they can't, they, they can't really, uh, uh, they don't have the volume of, of available organs. So he's rounding on this patient and this patient says, Professor Levy, uh, in two weeks, I'm going to China. And on this specific date at this specific time, I'm going to get a heart. And uh, Professor Levy looks at him and, and thought he was, he thought he was kidding. And uh, he realized he wasn't joking. And that's exactly what happened. And I was on an event just a couple months ago with Jay Levy, who said that that patient's still alive and still, uh, you know, still has this, this heart. But there's no doubt in my mind that that was somebody who was awaiting an ex, you know, who's waiting to be killed. And to, again, just to, to, to make it, to try to make it as clear as I can, these aren't people, Falun Gong were not condemned to death. They weren't sentenced to death. They never received a, a death sentence. These are prisoners of conscience that have been typed. And then if you are scheduled in two weeks, it's very likely that a Falun Gong practitioner will be 
killed in, in the ways that were described in that paper uh, for their organs. So yeah, that, that, that this is, um, you know, that this is, this is, this, to answer that question, if you're going go to go to, to, to China and in two weeks, that's not somebody, that's not even a scheduled execution because in Chinese code, they have one week to kill you if they're going to schedule an execution. The, the code says that you have to kill the prisoner within a week. So if you're scheduled two weeks out, that's just somebody that has been so dehumanized and essentially demonized that, that, that it's looked at as uh, this person's going to die anyways. Jeez, man. I mean, really disturbing stuff. Um, you know, another question here is from What's Up You asking where are these organs going? I think this raises that question again. Do, do the organs get out of China? Like, do, is there, is there, is this limited solely within China? Like, do, what, do we know anything about this? Yeah, I, I you know, I, 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 I've met David Maida several times and I've asked him the same question. And I, I think in general, the, the estimates are that, that are about 50% of the, 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 the organ transplants that are done in China are domestic. So they stay within China. They're probably wealthy Chinese or high ranking party officials. Um, and then 50% are, are organ tourists and predominantly Southeast Asia. There's a lot of countries like Israel, Spain, uh, uh, I think Australia that have tried to take a harder stance against their own citizens to go and, and receive an unethically sourced organ or an organ from a, you know, a, a system that's clearly unethical uh, but the, the, the best estimate that I could give is, is probably about half are domestic and half are, are, are probably going uh, uh, outside of China. Now, if you look at it, uh, just to give you some numbers, the number, so on the books, officially, the United States is the number one transplant uh, system in the, in the world. And annually, we do about 37,000 transplants. And that can, that can include kidneys and corneas and skin and heart and lungs and pancreas. Um, uh, so the, the, the number of organs that we do officially are 37,000. If you look at the uh, 2016 report, the estimate of the number of transplants that were being done in China, and this was looking at 160 some odd uh, transplant centers throughout China and trying to get an idea of the volume of each center based on how, you know, how many operating rooms they had, how busy the hospital was, what the revenue was, uh, what, how much anti-rejection drug they were using, et cetera. They, were, they used all these different uh, um, variables to look at how many transplants that are being done. The number of transplants being done in China is 60,000 to 100,000. Now, one person can donate a number of organs, you know, can donate three organs or more. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean 60,000 to 100,000 donors per year, but but at least tens of thousands of, of, of people are dying. And mostly, in, in, in mostly as the data uh, shows, mostly that those are innocent prisoners of conscience that are being killed on demand. Yeah, well, and, and, you know, and a lot of Martin, I'm just reading the comments, a lot of the audience is talking about, you know, the right to die. And I mean, even we know in the, in the United States, the abortion system, for example, is there's there's an organ trafficking system around it, unfortunately, in the United States, some that's been revealed by undercover investigators. And I, I think this brings up a, a big issue, which is there's systems in place that are kind of undermining the value of life. And this is my personal view like a lot of the movements we see whether it's the organ harvesting of chill of infants of unborn babies we know that some of the research financed by the um by the nih for example even looking at what they did with the chinese chinese laboratories um you know to create the humanized lungs of mice for example they were using these in these virus experiments uh they were using in the actual documents severed heads of infants for those things. I mean, horrifying stuff. Uh, we know that this stuff's being done. And this raises the bigger question and something and I, I talked to someone from your organization before, Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting, and they had something very concerning they brought up, which is because the Chinese Communist Party does so many organ transplants because they're killing people for them, they, right? No, other countries can't just murder people for, the, for this, like the Chinese Communist Party uh, does even though they're doing it illegally, and I think in the future it will be seen as such. Because they're doing it on such a large scale, they're the world leaders on the technology and the science around organ harvesting. And it kind of reminds me of what we saw during the Holocaust, where the Nazi scientists doing human experimentation unfortunately became like the world leaders on, on those fields. 
this raises, I think, the bigger question of the corruption spreading from the Chinese Communist Party and these systems to the scientific community. And the big issue is, is that if, if this is not stopped, if it's not made illegal within any body of science, like what does that mean for the future of science, medical science, and the future, especially as it relates to, I think, the value of human life and of people being killed for, for medicine, basically? Yeah, I, I I think you you bring up something that that you know that that I I can't even describe that that you know that how much it bothers me. I, I went into medicine thinking I was going to help people and help the world and you know sort of stay out of politics and and just be devoted to 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 human beings and human life. And and I, I think you bring up a you know you bring up something very important, which is you know I, I'll often say if you want to understand four store and harvesting think of all the data as this big train that's kind of running down these rails. Well, the two rails you have to understand are the history of transplant, which I've kind of talked about a little bit, but the history of transplant in China, which is essentially that they had none. Two, you have to understand the Falun Gong story. But but to me, the third rail is understanding the, the Chinese Communist Party and, and, and the evil of the Chinese Communist Party. And that's exactly what you said. It's the devaluing of human life. I mean, can you imagine being a, a doctor or surgeon? I, I was thinking about this yesterday. I, I, I went, I was consulting on patients yesterday and I saw a patient who is a prisoner and he's, and he's dying of, of cancer. And when I went and saw him, you know, I, I walk away, I, I never look at what they did. I don't look it up. I don't, I don't really want to know because my obligation isn't to judge that person or what they've done or what they haven't done. My, my obligation is to take the best care I can of, of a human being that's in front of me, and so I, I, I think this is the this is the the real. I mean, personally, I think this has been a problem with COVID, uh, that that we have as a medical system not stayed true to to, to sort of our ideals. But forced organ harvesting is one of the worst examples of this. Of saying, okay a totalitarian regime, the Chinese Communist Party, that has very successfully uh, uh, dehumanized the Falun Gong and allowed the, the, the medical system to, to also propagate that dehumanization and look at these people like they're, they, they don't deserve life, I, I think is, a, is something that we have to expose, we have to bring forward, we have to, just what you asked me, we have to, we have to ask the question of who is you know, who is responsible, who is complicit, what does that complicity look like? How do they pay for, for what they've done? Um, and certainly the, the, you know, the, the medical system in China really does need retribution. Yeah. You know, my, my father-in-law was a physician in Cambodia, um, you know, at the time ahead of and during the Khmer Rouge, when, yeah, of course, the Communist Party there killed about a third of the population of Cambodia, a third to a half, depending on the, the estimates you go by. He told me something interesting. So basically, actually, anyone interested, uh, he did an interview with American thought leaders not too long ago. And his stories are just heartbreaking, honestly. There weren't that many physicians in Cambodia, and in those days, you know, he he treated the king, and he treated people who were peasants who, you know, they, they gave him fruit. They didn't have money. They, they'd give him fruit afterwards because, you, you know, you're not going to make money treating people who don't have money. But he understood that there was the Hippocratic Oath, that you take an oath as a doctor to save people's lives. One thing that hurts him the most was when the Khmer Rouge took over, and he was, you know, in, in the main city there in Cambodia, and he was in charge of the infant ward, you know, with all the children. And when the Khmer Rouge came, they made them abandon all the infants and all the sick children. And uh, to this day, he talks about this, and he'll he'll break down. Unfortunately, I mean, it's really really heartbreaking stuff. But it ties back to the the issue, I think. Of, I, th I think getting into it, we're talking about the medical systems and corruption spreading really within the medical systems. One thing I want to get into then, just kind of last question, but real quick, you know, to what extent are the hospitals complicit in this? 
because if hospitals, I know, I know in some countries they've banned, uh, or you know, organ tourism. But I know some doctors will even recommend and even help organize uh, transportation of patients to China for organ transplants. To what extent are hospitals around the world complicit in this? Yeah, I think this is the, the this is the most critical question. Is you know, the, the, there first has to be, and Josh, I, I think that I think the real problem that we suffer from. Um, before we can even get there is that everybody knows what the data is, what the evidence is. I mean, it's amazing to me that from the original Madis and Kilgore report in 2006 to the 2016 update called Bloody Harvest, the Slaughter and Update, to the tribunal, between those three reports alone, and that's not all the data, but there's 1,483 pages of data, predominantly Chinese data, and I can tell you that I can go walk down the hall to our hospital right up the hall here. And if I pull the entire medical community, 5%, maybe 10% has heard of forced organ harvesting. And most think it's black market organ transplant, right? This is very different. It's not a group of individuals that have kind of gone rogue and are, you know, taking the kidneys out of some poor farmer and paying them, but they, they live through that, that organ donation. This is, this is, the killing on demand of, of innocent prisoners of conscience. I think, I, I think, I do think, as I said earlier, I do think there's a, a serious problem of complicity uh, with training uh, uh, Chinese, with sending uh, our citizens to go get unethically sourced organs. Um, but ultimately, I think until it is something that all of us know, and I can tell you, I think it's mostly willful blindness uh, by a lot of people that hear about it. But it's also just the shocking nature of it. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a pharmacist here yesterday, and you know, he said, "How's everything going in 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 the world of of raising, you know, raising awareness on forced organ harvesting?" And at, within a couple of minutes, this is somebody I've talked to multiple times. Within a couple of minutes, he didn't know that these were not people condemned to death, right? So it, even understanding what it is, understanding, I think the most important question you asked me today is probably. What is Falun Gong? Because I think that's the question. I, I think people just go, but why? And but why? And you say, well, you have to understand the Chinese Communist Party, but why? It, it's almost impossible to answer how something can be that evil against you know, an innocent group of people. But you have to understand more the Chinese Communist Party, probably more than you, you, you understand Falun Gong. Well, ex explain, explain this to us, because I, I think this is, I think a lot of people have that question, like, this is horrifying is is there any justification for it so i mean explain this to us yeah i i, I mean i i think that you know i think that when somebody like jong zemin again today is the the 23rd anniversary yeah, so for, July former leader of the chinese communist party jiang zemin yeah yeah and and uh, here here we are 23 years later but this was somebody's you know, this was somebody's personal jealousy, somebody's rage, some something that people can't control. And I think trying to control people's hearts by coercion, by fear, by intimidation, essentially, I think that's where that that's really what launched it. You have a you have a a practice that's peaceful, that has peaceful resistance, that really are, are turning people's hearts back to the the the, the ancient traditions of of China. Um, but really universal values of truth and compassion and tolerance and somebody that wants to control that is going to do so by by means of the state or by means of, of a totalitarian government and so i i i it's it's hard to wrap your head around well but what it because i think you still go well, what do they do well they they didn't do anything and and i think one of the things that that uh, uh you know the one one of the things that david made us often points out very well is you know, the, the, the crackdown on Falun Gong says a lot more about the Chinese Communist Party than it does about Falun Gong. And you are looking at a party that 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 essentially is out for control overall. Uh, I mean, control is more important than, than anything else, than human life, than the individual, than uh, even than than of its own society. So I, I, I wish I could, you know, I wish I could I could encapsulate it. But I the way that I look at it is these are ancient values. These are respect respect for the divine, respect for one another. Um, these are these are traditional values that move people's hearts. And you don't have to agree with them, but you have to realize that these are good people that were 
that, that essentially were cracked down on uh, by a totalitarian, heavy-handed government that simply wants control over every citizen, every facet of, it, of its society. Hmm. Well, and, and you can look at the response of Falun Gong to it, where despite all of this, and even despite the, the persecution in China, you don't really see reports of them even fighting or anything like that. To, to even face horrors, I mean, horrors in, in the truest sense of the word, to face that in a way as peacefully as they have is, is something else, you know. Yeah, there's, there's a horrific, you can listen to, there was a, a prison guard, I think he testified in 2009 to the world, uh, the world organization to investigate the persecution of Falun Gong. And the, this guard, like you were mentioning, Josh, about your father-in-law, he just breaks down with the horrors that he was, he was witnessing, but he was in the room while they were cutting open this young Falun Gong practitioner alive. Uh, they were cutting her chest open for, for transplant. And she's screaming, Falun Dafa how? And he's sitting there and he can't keep going because he realized this is a human being and what they're doing to this human being was so horrific. And this yeah, is something... Falun Dafa how it, meaning, meaning Falun Dafa is good in Chinese. Yeah. 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 So, uh, th you know, this is, th this is something that it, it, it really is this, you know, in, in my field, at least in the medical field, one of the biggest clashes of, of, of good and evil. And, and it is hard because... You know, I think it's it, we often will do what's convenient over with, with what's difficult. And I, I think that that's a you know, it's a hard thing as an entire field. And like I said, I think the individuals, I think most individuals that, that I talk to are very, very supportive and horrified. But I think the moment you try to say, well, you know, it, it's kind of like this, uh, I don't know, like a game of chicken or something where it's like, who's going to step forward first? And, and I think people are terrified of the Chinese Communist Party. You know, just last question here. Um, yeah, really, thank you for taking the time for this. But this is from VRWLK9. It says, Dr. G. Weldon Gilchrist, we are most appreciative you have stood up for humanity. Thank you for all you have endured to expose this atrocity. How can humanity support your efforts beyond our prayers? Well, I, I, I would say uh, visit, visit the website, Doctors Against Forest Story and Harvesting or dafo.org. I think the one thing you could do, and truly you can, we have the, you know, we have HR 6319 that you can reach out to government officials to try to garner support. And I would say any medical professional, you know, let them have them, you know, have them Google or look up, uh, uh, however they look up um, the China Tribunal. And they can watch Human Harvest. I think those are two ways that you can really get a lot of information. Human Harvest is a documentary done by Leon Lee that I think is, is you know, I think it's one of the best documentaries that, that we have on forest and harvesting. But I, 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 that's what I think you can do. You, you can lend support to Doctors Against Forest and Harvesting by going to dafo.org and then uh, essentially telling any medical professional you know, whatever they do in the medical field about it. Hey, hey, Dr. Weldon Gilchrist, thanks again for taking the time for this. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, nice talking to you. Thank you. Well, folks, um, a difficult topic. Thank you for sticking it out. It's, um, and I, again, not, not easy topics sometimes, but, you know, we have to, I think it needs to be exposed, frankly. And, and sometimes being able to talk about things that matter mean talking about things that are quite unpleasant. You know, this raises, I think, a lot of major issues for us here in the United States. One, you know, the United States really has, criticize it as you will, really has been a beacon when it comes to standing up for the idea that humans, we as people, do have innate rights. The, the whole idea that, you know, we have rights bestowed unto us by God and that government is instituted among men to protect those rights, this is one of the foundations of the American idea. And if you look at history and the way that America changed, really, the course of the world, this was the main system, the, ma the main concept that really had, I think, the biggest effect with that. The nature of government, the nature of natural God-given rights. And I would say also that it's that system that's now under attack. If you look at the... I talk a lot about U.S. politics and stuff, but I also touch on some uh, quite a bit every now and then about this 
global conflict between the U.S. system and the Chinese Communist Party system, or you could even think on a, on a more fundamental scale, the, the battle fundamentally between freedom and socialism. This is, I think, the conflict that defines the time that we're in. And, of course, in my show, and all of you joining me for it, I think you're aware that we touch on this quite a bit. This battle, essentially, will determine the future of humanity. This, this battle we're in right now, this freedom versus socialism, will determine, I think, where the world heads for the next hundred or more years. I personally believe that, uh, really, the side of socialism is, is falling. And I say that despite the fact that I think you see, you see them making a lot more noise on the surface. I think this goes back to the Chinese concept, an art of war, Sun Tzu, which is when you're strong, appear weak. When you're weak, appear strong. When they make a lot of noise, when they fight a lot, when they make a big show of things, usually it's not because they're strong. If they need to censor you, it's not because that they're right. It's because they know their arguments can't win against yours. Now, on this note of human rights, folks, I hope you can help get the word out on this. I, I don't, I mean, we did, we did a whole episode on this today. I really wanted to really nail down the evidence on this. Because, again, people, I think generally people are aware that live organ harvesting of innocent people is happening in China, that the communist government in China is doing this. What they don't know is the evidence on it. Many of them have never been exposed to the evidence. And so they still think it's rumor or, you know, maybe propaganda or whatever. The evidence is there, and I hope this episode has helped show you that evidence. Folks, again, please help share this video, get the word out. That said as well, as always, please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you.